The subcommittee will come to order. <clears throat> Chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. In fiscal year 2014, the Medicare program will cover nearly 54 million Americans. And the Congressional Budget Office, CBO, estimates that total Medicare spending will be approximately $603 billion, $591 billion of which will be spent on benefits. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, FY 213 agency financial report, the improper payment rate for Medicare fee for service, FFS, was 10.1 percent last year. Adding in the improper payments for Part C and D with error rates of 11.4 percent and 3.1 percent respectively, improper payments totaled over $49.8 billion. Independent estimates of the real cost of waste, fraud, and abuse in Medicare are much higher. Why are these figures important? The Medicare Trust Fund is set to go bankrupt sometime in the next decade. Absent congressional action, the Congressional Research Service, CRS, has stated Part A benefits cannot be paid out while the trust fund is insolvent. That is simply unacceptable. We cannot afford a future where our seniors' hospital bills go unpaid. Every taxpayer dollar must be protected. Some of my colleagues have suggested that merely eliminating the multi-billion dollar losses due to inefficiency and fraud will alone fix the insolvency problem. That claim is, frankly, false. While reducing waste, fraud, and abuse and <clears throat> managing the program more effectively should be an administration priority, that alone is not enough to address Medicare spending problem. However, critics are correct that a congressional solution is needed. We must do everything in our power to safeguard the money in the trust fund until such time as Congress accepts its responsibility to make structural changes to save the program for the millions who depend on it. Medicare uses a variety of contractors to assist in paying provider claims, delivering benefits, and carrying out program integrity and oversight functions. Many of these contractors have valuable experience fighting fraud and efficiently managing health insurance programs. Yet sometimes federal law or administrative barriers prevent us from using their expertise to prevent waste, fraud, and mismanagement in the Medicare program. Other times, all that is missing is a dose of common sense and leadership. This committee has for years studied the problem and reviewed potential new programs to help CMS fight waste, fraud, and abuse. This is not one of these hearings. Today's hearing is an opportunity to hear from experts about the challenges CMS faces in administering the program. In fact, today's hearing is a first step toward a broader, long-term effort to build consensus about the best ways to modernize the Medicare program in its management, operations, and accountability. And the best way to strengthen Medicare is to help improve and modernize the business model of the agency that oversees the Medicare program, CMS. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine how CMS currently uses and oversees these contractors to lessen program vulnerabilities and protect seniors' benefits by increasing accountability and cost effectiveness. Long term, I hope to work with my colleagues to identify barriers in federal law and within CMS itself that prevent contractors from fighting waste, efficiency, fraud, and abuse, and I hope we will address them. I'm pleased to have witnesses from both GAO and <clears throat> the HHS OIG with us today to discuss the types and functions of Medicare contractors and how the program can better manage them to meet its goals. I would note that the HHS OIG is releasing two new reports today on these topics, and I look forward to the testimony of all of our witnesses. With that, I will yield back and recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Pallone, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing on the management of Medicare. For nearly 50 years, Medicare has served as a bedrock program for our nation's seniors and disabled. What started as a basic benefit covering hospital stays and doctor's visits has continuously evolved and now encompasses comprehensive health care coverage 
that millions rely on. But in order to build upon the promise of the program, Congress and the administration must continue to find ways to strengthen the program so it works better for beneficiaries and taxpayers alike. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, known as CMS, is tasked with the critical role of administering the program to 50 million beneficiaries. Since Medicare's inception, CMS has enlisted a number of different contractors in different ways throughout the program to help assist in that responsibility. In Parts A and B, they use contractors to help pay the millions of claims from providers, as well as enroll providers. In Medicare Advantage, or MA, and the Part D benefit, CMS utilizes the private sector, specifically private insurers, to administer the benefits directly to beneficiaries. In addition, CMS enlists benefit integrity contractors to help further root out waste, fraud, and abuse. In all these instances, however, CMS is responsible for overseeing all of the contractors' performance and ensuring they bring value and quality to the program. It is also CMS's role to conduct regular oversight of plans to ensure that the payments are legitimate and appropriate while simultaneously serving beneficiaries as well. And that is why last summer I introduced the Part D Prescription Drug Integrity Act of 2013, which I believe can help CMS address potential factors contributing to prescription drug abuse. I wrote the bill on the heels of a report by HHS's Office of Inspector General, the OIG, which found that Medicare is paying for prescription drugs prescribed by unauthorized individuals. Given that tens of thousands of these drugs are controlled substances, the study's findings raise questions about patient safety because of the high potential for abuse and diversion. My bill would require plan sponsors to verify that a prescription for a drug on the controlled substances list was made by an authorized physician before paying for the drug. Under the current law, such a requirement does not exist. It would also require plan sponsors to have drug utilization programs in place that would restrict access if there was credible evidence of beneficiaries abusing or diverting drugs. In addition, the bill would provide CMS new tools to prevent the payment of claims by fraudulent prescribers or pharmacies. Now, I think we can all agree that this necessitates constant work. My bill is just one of many ideas to improve Medicare moving forward. The Affordable Care Act made great strides. It expanded benefits to seniors, brought payments to MA closer to traditional Medicare, and rewards plans for quality. It also gave CMS, the OIG, and DOJ increased authorities to address fraud. And since its passage, the administration has recovered nearly $20 billion to taxpayers, a record $4.2 billion in 2013 alone. And of course, just last week, this committee heard directly from CMS about the ways in which they hope to continue to strengthen Part D through a number of different policies. And so I applaud the administration for the work that they've done to date, and I commend the strong commitment to fighting fraud, waste, and abuse in the Medicare program. The data clearly shows that we're moving in the right direction. But as we'll hear today, more can always be done. In fact, the OIG will issue two reports identifying a number of flaws in oversight of MA and Part D plans and the benefits they provide, specifically regarding data collection. I look forward to hearing more about these recommendations. In fact, uh, uh, Mr. Waxman and I intend to encourage CMS to quickly adopt these improvements. So let me thank our witnesses for their participation and work on this topic. The GAO and OIG offer critical insight that informs both CMS and the Congress of what continues to need improvement. And together, we must all commit to improving the quality and efficiency of Medicare and be responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars. Robust and aggressive oversight of contractors is critical to this mission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back uh, the remainder of my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, five minutes from opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for more than four decades, Medicare has been a critical program for ensuring the health and also the financial well-being of seniors and people with disabilities. The program has evolved significantly over that time, adding benefits, adding coverage options, and becoming a major force in the U.S. health care market. As the program has grown and changed, so too has the oversight role of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or what we call CMS. CMS works with private contractors, especially in the original Medicare, the fee-for-service program, to perform the day-to-day -day program operations such as paying claims, 
enrolling providers and conducting first level appeals. In parts C and D of Medicare, CMS contracts with private insurance companies to deliver Medicare's benefits. In either case, CMS is ultimately responsible for making sure that the Medicare trust fund dollars paid to these contractors are used appropriately and soundly. We know from past experience that without strong oversight from CMS, contractors do not always perform adequately and have the potential to abuse the public trust. I'm glad we'll be hearing from both the Office of Inspector General, OIG, and the Government Accountability Office, GAO, today. These two organizations have been critical watchdogs for the Medicare program, alerting us to instances where Medicare's oversight should be strengthened and also areas where federal intervention is necessary to ensure the taxpayers' dollars are being used appropriately. A lot has been achieved since passage of the Affordable Care Act to strengthen Medicare. Medicare growth rates have been at an all-time low. This success in redu reducing the rate of spending growth has been achieved at the same time that benefits have been increased and out-of-pocket costs have been reduced for beneficiaries. And fraud-fighting activities have been more successful than ever. Just like last week, HHS announced that the heat strike forces successfully recovered $4.3 billion in taxpayer funds, the highest annual amount recovered to date for a total of $19.2 billion in recoveries over the last five years. The administration continues to work to improve the program. The administration's proposed Part D regulation would make a number of changes to the program to strengthen program management and integrity. Some want to rescind this regulation, but if we are truly serious about program integrity, those proposed program integrity provisions are just the direction CMS should be taking. Two OIG reports that were released today note significant concern with reporting of fraud and abuse incidents in the Medicare Advantage and Part D program. There is wide variability in reporting, and many have failed to report any potential fraud and abuse incidents at all. CMS needs to do a better job managing the private insurance companies that participate in, in Medicare. But Congress needs to do its part by giving CMS the funds to do its work. We all know that CMS budget has been inadequate in recent years. For example, while CMS has added nearly 3 million beneficiaries to the Medicare program over the last two years, the funding provided by Congress to administer the Medicare program and fight fraud, waste, and abuse has remained essentially flat. Whether we're talking about appropriate funding for nursing home survey and certification, funding for claims processing and provider education, or funding for implementation of the Affordable Care Act. We should not let our austerity get in the way of proper program management, but I'm concerned that is just what is happening. Starving the agency is no more justified than voting to kill Medicare outright by enacting Chairman Ryan's voucher plan. All things considered, this administration has done a remarkable job of improving program oversight and management, but we do have more work to do, so I'm pleased that we'll be hearing about those areas for improvement today. In closing, I'd like to make sure that my message is clear. Is, is the Medicare program an effective program? Yes. Are, the are there opportunities to improve Medicare management, oversight, and overall performance, of course. And we can do that without harming beneficiaries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. All members' written testimony will be opening statements be made part of the record. We have one panel before us today. Ms. Kathleen King, Director, Health U.S. Government Accountability Office. Our first witness, Dr. James Cosgrove, Director, Healthcare U.S. Government Accountability Office. Our second witness, and 
Mr. Robert Vito, Regional Inspector General for Evaluation and Inspections, Office of Inspector General, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, is our third witness. Thank you very much for coming today. Your written testimony will be made part of the record. You'll have five minutes to summarize your testimony. At this point, uh, the Chair recognizes Ms. King, five minutes for her opening statement. Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the subcommittee, my colleague James Cosgrove and I are pleased to be here today to discuss the role that contractors and private plans have in the Medicare program. CMS relies extensively on contractors to assist it in carrying out its responsibilities, including program administration, management, oversight, and benefit delivery. Contractors have played a vital role in the administration of the program since its enactment in 1965. In fact, Congress designed the original Medicare program so that it would be administered by health insurers or similar organizations experienced in handling hospital and physician claims. Congress also stipulated the process for selecting contractors, which differed from the way that most other federal contractors were awarded in that Medicare contracts were not awarded by a competitive process. Beginning in the 1980s, the Department of Health and Human Services asked Congress to amend its authority regarding the selection of contractors. It wanted to open the process to a broader set of contractors and increase its ability to reward contractors that were performing well. In the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003, Congress repealed the statutory limitations on the types of contractors that CMS could use and required compliance with the federal acquisition regulation and competitive procedures to select new contractors. Congress also required CMS to develop performance standards for the new contractors called MACs, or Medicare Administrative Contractors, and gave CMS the authority to provide incentives to the contractors for good performance. The MACs are responsible for a wide variety of claims administration functions, including processing and paying claims, handling the first level of appeals, and conducting medical review of claims. CMS is responsible for overseeing the MACs. Over time, Congress has also authorized the use of other types of contractors in Medicare for program integrity purposes, including investigating potential fraud and recovering overpayments. Unlike Medicare fee-for-service, in which contractors process and, play and pay claims, in Medicare Part C, known as Medicare Advantage, CMS contracts with private organizations to offer health plans that provide all Medicare covered services except hospice care and may provide other services not available under fee for service. CMS first began contracting with private plans to provide care to enrolled beneficiaries in 1973. Over time, Congress has made various changes in the program, most notably paying plans on a risk basis. As of February 2014, nearly 30 percent of Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in Medicare Advantage, which is an all-time high. While Medicare contract requirements and program parameters are largely derived from statute, CMS has responsibility to implement the program and ensure compliance with requirements. While Medicare Part C provides beneficiaries an alternative to obtaining their Medicare benefits through fee-for-service, Congress structured the Medicare Part D program to, pro to provide benefits only through private organizations under contract to Medicare. Prescription drug benefits are provided either through Medicare Advantage plans or standalone private plans. Medicare pays sponsors a monthly amount per capita independent of each beneficiary's drug use. The Part D program relies on plan sponsors to generate prescription drug savings through negotiating price concessions with entities such as drug manufacturers, pharmacy benefit managers and pharmacies, and managing beneficiary use of drugs. As with Medicare Advantage, while CMS contracts with plan sponsors to provide the Part D benefit, it is responsible for administration of the program. 
including ensuring that payments made to plans are accurate and that the data plan sponsors submit on price concessions are accurate. Mr. Chairman, this concludes our prepared remarks. We'd be happy to answer questions. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. Now I recognize Dr. Cosgrove, five minutes for opening statement. Uh, Chairman Pitts, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ms. King has submitted a uh, joint statement for both of us covering GAO, and as such, I don't have a separate oral statement. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize Mr. Vito, five minutes for his opening statement. Pull, pull it closer and poke the uh, button, make sure it's on. Okay, thank you. you. All right, try that. Okay. I'm loud. All right. <laughs> okay. Is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I am Robert Vito, Regional Inspector General for the Office of Evaluation and Inspections at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about CMS oversight of Medicare contractors. Two years ago, I testified before you about reoccurring problems that we had identified with CMS oversight of benefit integrity contractors. CMS relies on contractors to administer half a trillion of dollars in Medicare spending every year. OIG understands that effective oversight of Medicare contractors is continuous, demanding, and often resource-intensive process for CMS. Unfortunately, some of the same problems we identified in the past with CMS oversight of benefit integrity contractors also extend to, our, to other CMS contractors. Today, the OIG is releasing two reports that highlight similar oversight problems with Medicare Advantage and Part D. The OIG has found that CMS does not leverage data to improve oversight, does not investigate variation in data across contractors, does not address underperforming contractors timely and require corrective action plans, and does not share information with beneficiaries and other stakeholders that could assist anti-fraud efforts. Since 2008, we have repeatedly recommended that CMS require Part D plans to report fraud and abuse data. Rather, CMS merely encourages Part D plans to voluntarily report these data. Under this voluntarily reporting system, less than half of the Part D plans have reported data, and the reported data have varied significantly across plans. Due to CMS's failure to investigate variation among plans, we do not know if the plans are reporting incorrect data, have ineffective programs to detect fraud and abuse, or lack a common understanding of what constitutes a potential fraud and abuse incident. Further, without detailed information on fraud and abuse incidents, CMS is missing the opportunity to discover and alert plans and law enforcement to emerging fraud and abuse schemes. CMS has also made use of Part C data to oversee Medicare Advantage plans, despite investments in contractors' review of the data. The Part C reporting requirement data are a significant resource for oversight and improvement of Medicare Advantage. CMS has implemented regular and intensive reviews of the Part C data through its contractor, but conducted minimal follow-up on the data issues that it identified. For example, CMS has not determined if outlier data reflected inaccurate reporting or atypical plan performance. CMS also has not used its contractor data reports and analysis to inform the selection of plans for audits or to issue compliance notices for performance concerns. This would be like taking your car to a mechanic, having them run diagnostic tests, and then not using the test to determine if your car is running well and safe to drive. Our review of the MAC administrative contractors found that CMS performance reviews of MACs were extensive, but were not always timely. And even when CMS identified quality standards that were not met, CMS did not always resolve the problem. There were two MACs that consistently underperformed, but these MACs had their option years re renewed. Lastly, CMS is missing a critical opportunity to enlist millions of Medicare beneficiaries in the fight against fraud. MACs mail Medicare summary notices, or MSNs, to beneficiaries to show them what Medicare claims have been paid on their behalf. These notices can serve as a key fraud and detection tool, 
when beneficiaries identify and report suspicious information contained on their MSNs. However, the OIG found that over 4 million notices were not delivered to the beneficiary. Further, CMS has not instructed MACS on whether or how to track or follow up on undelivered MSNs. It is critical that MSNs be timely and appropriately delivered to beneficiaries. If just one beneficiary sees something suspicious on their notice and reports it to Medicare, it may lead to a fraud case that saves millions of dollars. In conclusion, the OIG recognizes the challenging job CMS faces in the oversight of its contractors. OIG has recommended actions that CMS could undertake, and now CMS is considering some of these recommendations. Thank you again for your interest in this important area and for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. <clears throat> we'll now begin questioning. I'll begin the questioning, recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. Uh, Mr. Vito, CMS likes to tout that it has moved away from the pay and chase system. One of the programs they have pushed to support this claim is the fraud prevention system which Congress mandated in the Small Business Jobs Act of 2010. The system is supposed to scan claims on a prepay basis and proactively flag problematic claims for review. The last report found that the Inspector General's team could not validate most of the resulted savings from the program. Do you expect that to change this year? Uh, I don't know the answer, but I can tell you that we will be having a report, and that report will do the same things that the last year's report did, and that report, I believe, will be coming out probably in the next three to four months, and you should have that in front of you, and you will be able to see the results of our work. Do you know how many claims, if any, CMS actually stopped before they were paid as a result of this system? I, I do not know that answer. I'm not familiar with that review, but I know that that review is ongoing and that we will have results for you. And do you have any ideas on how to make the system stronger? Well, we certainly have some ideas on how to make the system stronger. One of the ways is to that the require plans to mandatorily report this information on fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, I, I think once they do that, then CMS will have data that will indicate the types of fraud incidences that are occurring. It will also tell you the amount of them. Once you have data, then you can analyze that data and use that data in conjunction with other data to find out more information that you never had. Uh, Ms. King, CMS is developing a new integrity contractor called a United Program Integrity <coughs> Contractor, UPIC. These uh, contractors will focus on both Medicare and Medicaid integrity issues. And the Zone Program Integrity Contractors, ZPICs, and the Medicare Administrative Contractors, the MACs, will be folded into the UPICs. Is this an important change, or are we just rearranging the deck chairs? Uh, related, has your office seen better results from the ZPIC since they were developed out of the program safeguard contractors? Mr. Chairman, we did a review that was released last fall about the ZPICs, and we, we found that they did have a positive return on investment. They spent a little over $100 million, and they returned, or they saved about $250 million. Uh, during that time. We, we did make some suggestions for improvement, but we did see a positive rate of return from them. And I think in terms of the consolidation of the uh, program integrity contractors, the Medicare and Medicaid integrity contractors are going to be combined into one. We haven't evaluated that, but we did find fault uh, with some of the Medicaid program integrity work. And, but I, I do believe that the MACs are going to remain as they are and not be folded into that because they have a, while they do have some program integrity functions, um, they, they're one of their primary plane, one of their primary purposes is processing and paying claims and that will remain. Dr. Cosgrove, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Um, Continuing with the GAO, to help manage the, the program, CMS often uses cost plus contracts. But if the contracting team at CMS writes a contract 
that measures the wrong things, like outputs instead of outcomes, then CMS has committed to spend millions of dollars, perhaps on the wrong thing. How can this be prevented? Ms. King? You're right that they do use often cost plus contracts as under the FAR, under the Federal Acquisition Regulation, and that's one of the things that Congress authorized them to do during contractor reform. Um, we are now looking at um, some of the incentives that are provided to the MACs under their contracts to see if perhaps there could be um, better incentives put in the contract. And in some cases in contracts, we evaluated recently the um, HICFAC program, which is the Fraud and Abuse Control Program. And it, it was, it's hard to measure outcomes there because we don't know what the baseline is. We don't know what the baseline is for fraud. So that's an that's a inherent challenge. My time's expired. Chair recognizes the ranking member has flown five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Vito um, a question. Today, the OIG released the report on some of the shortcomings of the oversight of Part C or Medicare Advantage. And it sounds to me like Medicare Advantage plans have a lot of work to do in order to improve their fight of, uh, against fraud and abuse. First, can you tell me, do we know how much fraud and abuse is happening in Medicare Advantage? And second, what kind of data is CMS collecting and what additional data does OIG believe should be collected? Okay. Um, in, the part, in the Part D area, we, CMS has not voluntarily it, CMS has voluntarily collected only, they have only uh, voluntarily collected the information that we have requested. We have asked that they mandatorily report that information. That information would allow them to determine the number of fraud incidences that occurred. It would also let them know if, C if the M Medicare, it would let them know if the Part D plans had addressed those fraud incidences. By doing that information, it will provide information among all the different plans, and then the plans can analyze, then CMS can analyze that to find out which plans have higher numbers or lower numbers, and they could look into the variation to see what might be going on there. Well, I note from your report that while CMS did conduct some reviews on data reported under Part C, and now I'm asking about Part C, the agency did not conduct follow-up with the data or look at outliers, and I think we all agree that it's not enough to simply collect the data. The agency must act on it. So what does the OIG recommend CMS do, and how should CMS best be following up on this outlier data? Now I'm asking about Part C specifically. Well, well CMS has collected, they had a contractor that identified outliers, they uh, identified inconsistency in the data. Yet once they identified that, the contractor only shared that information w with the plan and CMS, and CMS did not do anything with that data. They did not investigate that data. They did not review why that data, wh what, the, what the reason was behind that data. Was that reporting information that was incorrect, or were they atypical outliers? And CMS can utilize the resources it has to do that extra step. For example, we saw some plans that had the same problem multiple years. Depending on the resources that CMS has, they can target the areas that are the most problematic, like the ones that had uh, multiple years or the one that had three or four uh, elements that needed to be looked at. So it's clear to, to us, we gave the example, it's like taking your car and having all the diagnostic tests run on the car and then not using the results of that to fix the car and make sure it's safe. It's basically CMS has information, and they're not using the information to, to, to get to the best answers. All right. Um, let me, I can ask this of any of you. If CMS has a duty to continue to improve the Medicare program while keeping costs down and fostering competition. It's also critical that they take every action within their authority to alleviate fraud, waste, and abuse. In its proposed rule issued in January, CMS proposed several provisions aimed at improving program management and integrity in the MA and Part D program, including requiring prescribers of Part D drugs to be enrolled in Medicare, providing CMS the authority to revoke abuse of prescribers' Medicare enrollment, and allowing CMS and its anti-fraud contractors to obtain information directly from pharmacies 
and pharmacy benefit managers that contract or subcontract with Part D sponsors. These provisions seem like common sense to me, but could any of you talk about the problem that Medicare faces with respect to abusive prescribing practices? How serious a problem it is? What do we know about how well Part D plans are doing dealing with improper prescribing? Any of you, any of you could answer this if I hear from you. I don't know the answer to the question specifically, but we do have some work uh, looking at Medicare Part D program integrity contractors at this point and seeing how their practices measure up with best practices in the private sector. So that's a question that we should be able to shed some light on, but I don't have the answer today. Mr. Vito, do you want to say anything about that? Yes. Um, the Office of Inspector General has been looking at the Part D program for a long time. We have initially started to look at the controls that were existing in the program. We found that CMS had some controls, but they were limited and they needed to do more. We have pointed that out to them. Um, we have a body of work that continues to show that they need to do more. The, the, the items that you referenced, many of them are direct results of work that the OIG has identified and pointed out. We have looked at the plans and found that the plans, ha some of them have not reported any information, and when they have reported, it, it varies significantly. <laughs> They're the first line. We also then looked at the, the medics. We found that the medics could do more, that they weren't proactively analyzing data. They weren't doing a lot of the things that you asked about, about the prescriber IDs. We found that they were paying claims that did not have a, a did not have a valid ID, a prescriber ID. And you also referenced reports where people were writing prescriptions and they didn't have the actual uh, responsibilities to do that. So all these things that you mentioned here are things that the OIG has pointed out and think need to be improved and had made a lot of recommendations to have them done. Thank you. Chair, thanks to gentlemen. And now I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gangry, five minutes for questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank, of course, all of the witnesses for coming uh, to allow the committee to better understand how Medicare is protecting seniors' benefits and how we can continue to reform the program to save the taxpayers' money while at the same time not overly burden the providers. I'm going to go to you, Mr. Vito, first. This is a hugely important uh, issue that uh, I'm sure all members are hearing from their constituents there physician, provider, uh, constituents. Uh, ICD-9, uh, those codes are set to be replaced uh, by ICD, International Classification of Diseases, 10 codes this October. These new codes, as you know, include thousands of, of new diagnosis codes, uh, adding, of course, new burdens for providers as they attempt to abide by the law. Many providers worry uh, that this, the new complexity could be a target-rich environment for auditors who might confuse an error with malintent. I'd like for you to comment on how your office thinks about this particular issue, uh, this uh, conversion in October, and I think that final rule has been issued uh, to, to go to the ICD-10 code. The providers, the doctors, the people that I speak to, in the 11th District of Georgia, Northwest Georgia, would beg CMS uh, to delay this conversion from ICD-9 to ICD-10. Well, I'd like to say that I believe that we have some planned work in that area. I cannot address your specific questions now because we need to do work to make the determination of what the issues are. But I do believe that we have work that's planned and it's in our work planning. It's in our work plan. And if you would like, we could take that question back or I could have people come up and brief you on that <clears throat> from our office that are more familiar with that work. Well, <coughs> excuse me. If you can elaborate a little bit more, or uh, Ms. King or Dr. Cosgrove, because uh, they, the providers even say that uh, even the meaningful users of electronic medical records, it was my thought that, well, that would kind of solve the problem. It would just be automatic. Uh, and, and they say no, no, that that wouldn't, is not going to help at all. Uh, do, do any of you have any thoughts about that? And, 
It's not an issue that we've looked at yet. I mean, most of our, all of our work really is evidence-based and, you know, while we agree that um, documentation errors are a big part of what contributes to improper payments, I think we would have to look at the implementation and then assess its effects before we could comment on yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, it's just for th those that are, are here that, that may not be uh, is, is up on this issue as, as you are and hopefully as I am, but I mean, it's like a physician, uh, if there's a code for a dog bite, uh, now there would have to be a, a, a code, that code would have to be, well, what was the breed of dog? And, and on and on and on, you get the idea. I mean, it gets a little ridiculous uh, and that's where they have thousands of additional codes that they have to worry about. Uh, I've heard from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, that if we could only fix waste, fraud, and abuse, then the Medicare program would be there, it'd be solvent for uh, my children, my four adult children, and my 13 grandchildren. We didn't, wouldn't have to do anything else. Uh, Chairman Ryan of the Budget Committee has been criticized many times for trying to uh, come up with innovative solutions to deal with the, what, $75 trillion worth of unfunded liability uh, in Social Security and Medicare as we go out into the future 50 years from now. Uh, but that's, those are obligations. They're, they're on the books. And uh, uh, tell me, uh, and we can start, Ms. King, with you and work down, uh, what are y'all's thoughts in regard to if we could eliminate every dime of waste, fraud, and abuse? I know we can't, but if we could, uh, do you think that that would save Medicare for the f future generations? No. <laughs> That's fine. No, <laughs> as Mr. Dingle would say, as Mr. Dingle would say, if he were here this morning, that's fine. Dr. Cosgrove. I'm going to echo the no. I mean, it's going to be a perpetual challenge to try to uh, address waste, fraud, and abuse in the program. It's a large program, and weeding it out is going to be a constant challenge. Uh, but given the demographics and the increase in technology, there are other I'm going to stop you right there. I want to make one closing comment. Mr. Vito, I apologize for that, but I did start with you. Mr. Chairman, the administration's attempts to constrain fraud and abuse need to meet the program integrity recommendations provided by GAO. We must make sure that these attempts are not overly burdensome to providers. They do not overly penalize them for honest mistakes. It's clear, however, in my opinion, that program integrity provisions alone will not provide a sustainable Medicare program for the future. It's my hope that my colleagues take a more serious look at structural reforms for Medicare that will create a sustainable program that continues to provide health care services and peace of mind to our precious seniors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentlelady from Virgin Islands, Dr. Christensen, five minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this hearing. I, I want to associate myself with part of my uh, colleague from Georgia's remarks about um, concerns about not placing undue burdens on, on our providers or um, mistakenly um, uh, address, charging them with uh, fraud and abuse. But um, thank you for this hearing. And I've had the experience on the MD side, uh, I, but I will say that the working, the operations of our Part B contractors have greatly improved in the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, but I still do get some complaints, and I hope that ours is not one, Mr. Vito, that's underperforming and still having their contract renewed. Um, yet despite the improvement, um, there seems to be a lot of, uh, based on your um, testimony, Mr. Vito, a lot of room for improvement still. I have a couple of questions. The first one relating to the Affordable Care Act, which strengthened the Medicare program in many aspects, not only enhancing program benefits, but also by bolstering anti-fraud and abuse efforts. For example, the ACA provided new provider enrollment and screening authorities to help CMS weed out bad providers and gave CMS new authority to place a moratorium on provider enrollments in areas with high fraud concerns. So. Uh, Mr. Vito and Ms. King, can you tell us more about CMS y using the new program integrity tools that were enacted in the ACA? Has the Medicare program improved as a result of these provisions in the Affordable Care Act? 
We looked at the uh, provisions of the law and the new enrollment processes shortly after they were enacted and when CMS was in the process of implementing them. Since then, we've not gone back and taken another look, but I do know that, that CMS has used its authority to impose uh, moratoriums on durable medical equipment and home health providers since then. Well, the Office of Inspector General is doing the exact job that you asked about. We are currently are looking at the Medicare enrollment, the enhanced provisions that came from the ACA, and we will have a report for you hopefully by the end of this year that will give you the details on how well they're doing and if there's any areas that need to be improved. Okay, and that, so that will give us um, areas where CMS should continue to focus. Yes, its we'll, efforts. we'll be able to tell you about how they're using their their extra warrant activities and what results they're achieving. Are there legislative actions that any one of you would recommend Congress take in order to build upon the ACA and continue to strengthen the anti-fraud and abuse efforts in the Medicare program at this time? No, I don't think we have matters pending before Congress that, that we have asked you to act on in that arena. Well, we have a couple ideas for you. Uh, we have been recommending now that CMS implement a mandatory reporting requirement for Part D, and they have not done it. They don't need to have legislation to do it, but it might be that you can help them achieve that through legislation. In addition to that, we also think that there might be some flexibility that you want to give CMS when they award contracts. Uh, this will allow them to not be in a perpetual contracting recompete mode and focus on the people that are underperforming and allow the people that are doing a good job to remain in the program. So this comes back to your question about the MACs. Mm -hmm. You know, if the MACs aren't doing a good job, we want them to make sure that they take action and, and to replace those. And CMS has done a, a fairly extensive job reviewing the MACs. They can do better in trying to address MACs that have underperformed, though. Thank you. And Ms. King or Mr. Cosgrove, we, we know that Medicare administrative contractors or MACs have set up claims processing systems in such a way that they're able to compare claim data to Medicare requirements in order to approve or deny claims or flag them for further review. A 2010 GAO report found that these prepayment edits saved Medicare at least $1.76 billion in fis fis dollars in fiscal year 2010, but that savings could have been greater had prepayment edits been more widely used and better disseminated across the max. This seems like common sense, especially given that these prepayment edits can minimize improper payments being made in the first place. Could you give us an estimate of how gr much greater savings could be? if prepayment edits were more widely used, and can you tell us more about your recommendations of whether CMS has implemented them? Uh, thank you for that question. I, use of prepayment edits are critically important to preventing improper payments because they do all kinds of things. They screen to see if the provider is eligible to participate, if the beneficiary is eligible, and they also look at whether the service is covered by Medicare and in some cases, they make decisions about whether the service is necessary in that situation. I don't think we have an estimate of how much you know, more could be saved if there were greater implementation of prepayment edits, but we did make a number of recommendations to sort of refine the process and, um, and, and make it clear. I would like to say one. I would be remiss if I didn't say this. I think if Congress can consider funding the OIG fully, I think it would benefit the program. We have a eight to one return. So you give us one dollar, we get eight dollars back. We've been in a hiring freeze. We have had budget crisis. We're not able to do the work that we, we would like to do. And if you were able to fund us, we could achieve these results. So that's one thing that I've, I didn't bring to your attention, but I would like to thank you for considering it. Chair, Chair, thanks. General Lady, now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It gives me a chance to uh, promote one of my colleagues from Illinois, Mr. Roskam's bill, the Prime Act, which is addressing the pay and chase issue, which was kind of mentioned in, in some of the opening statements. And, and um, I want to make sure I, I put that on the record. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Vito, uh, using your car analogy, 
if one's a Cadillac where someone has payments of $3,000 a year, one's a Buick and that payment is $1,000 a year, and the Chevy is a three, their payment per month is $350 a year, and you propose cost savings of uh, uh, $250 per month to all these payments, uh, and, and the individual can't afford e any of those cars, does that save them from losing their vehicles? I think in the analogy that you gave, it doesn't, but that, that was not. No, no, well, let me, let, I'm yeah, just sorry. starting. I'm just warming up here. <laughs> um, so, Sydney, if you'd put the chart on here. So, and that's what uh, Dr. Gingrey was talking about, too, and, and, and Ms. King and Dr. Cosgrove and I think Mr. Vito, that's, um, that's where we're at today. Um, uh, the, uh, the red is the mandatory spending, the blue is the discretionary budget. When, when we have our budgetary fights and, and the shutting down of government, it's only that blue section that we're fighting on. The, this is the whole debate. If, uh, and Ms. King and Ms. Dr. Crosgrove, you, you answered correctly. We, could, we can save a couple billion dollars here and there but that fundamentally does not affect the solvency of our mandatory programs. It's, it's almost like pocket lint. Now, it's good to get that lint out of your pocket, but it doesn't fundamentally affect the solvency issue. In fact, my friend uh, who, who just, I just followed talked about Obamacare or the ACA. It took seven or 16 billion out of Medicare. And that, and we had a t hearing. We had a hearing last week on Medicare D, and Medicare D is changing to pay for uh, this this expansion. So I, I want to ask this question to Mr. Mr. Vito. I want to follow up. So in 2012, HHS is said to recoup four billion from a program integrity effort, but roughly half of okay, four billion and Medicare is $466 billion. This is 2012 numbers. But roughly half of that was due to settlements with pharmaceutical companies, and the agency spent about $1 billion in total costs, so that leaves about $1 billion in actual recoup money for a year. Can you give me a sense of what that amount is in the scope of the overall Medicare spending, if we're just using 2012? We've got one billion in savings. We've got 466 billion in overall cost. It's it's good for a resume, but it's not really good for solving the problems of Medicare. Wouldn't you agree? Well, uh, we we are responsible for doing our work, and our work is to identify fraud, waste, and abuse, and as well as to make sure the programs are running efficient as possible. We, we are doing that, and, and you're, you're right, that $1 billion, or we actually, I mean, when you look at our results, we have good, good results, and, and we're doing very hard work. I, I think, though, the point that you're trying to make is that it's a very challenging program, and there's a lot of money. It's well, it's challenging because it's going broke, and my colleagues on the other side will not, will, will not accept that premise. They just will not accept the premise that it, we, we have to actuarially make some changes. Let me go to a, a, specific, part of the report, a specific part of the report. Um, as part of its efforts to reduce Medicare fraud and abuse, CMS relies on beneficiaries to report suspicious activity identified on their Medicare summary notices. Medicare summary notices are paper forms that summarize process claims. Your office found that over 4 million Medicare summary notices mailed to beneficiaries were not delivered in 2012. Can you, in the time remaining and whatever the else the chairman allows, can you talk through that, that issue and that problem? Yes. Uh, an MSN is basically telling you what services that Medicare has paid for. And CMS says that it's the best defense against fraud that a beneficiary can do is to look at their MSN. And when they look at their MSN, if they see services that are not that they, that they did not receive, then they could then they can report it. In New York last year, there was a, a case where a beneficiary 
saw that, looked at the MSN or its family, noted that the, the services that were being billed to them, they did not receive them. And then they started the case. The case was a $10 million case. So w when you look at the MSNs, they're very critical pieces of information that I, I personally got an MSN, not from Medicare, thank God, I'm not that old, but, but I did note that there was some there was some indication that I was having a, a procedure that is only good for a woman. But, but I looked at that, and then I was able to call that, call that in, and then they resolved that. So it, it, that is one of the best tools. And, and if just one beneficiary does, looks at that and, and it results in $10 million, it's a great saving. Can you, can you speak to the $4 million in the report? Yes, $4 million is a small number compared to the total. No, about the not being mailed out. Oh, the, yes, I can. C when we started this review, CMS had no idea on the number of MSNs that were not being delivered. They, they had no totals. We actually went to each MAC and asked each MAC to tell us how many MSNs they had that weren't getting to where they needed to be. Th this is important because without knowing that, you don't know what the extent of the problem is. That's why we went out and did this. This had already been pointed out to CMS two times previously in, in annual reports. And CMS, they, they thought about doing it, but they found out that it cost money to have some people at the MAC doing this. So they made a decision not to do that. Okay, the Chair, thanks the gentleman. And now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Arrakis, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, the first question is uh, for the panel. Uh, the IRS does an estimate of how much money they should be collecting and compares that to how much money they actually collect. This gives them a sense of how many people are not complying with the tax code or are uh, tax evaders. We report on how much money is recovered from fraud arrests, but without any measurement of the fraud problem. It's hard to know how much of a difference we're making. Have you ever done an official estimate of fraud in the Medicare program? And has CMS ever done an official estimate uh, for the panel? So we'll start with Ms. Yeah, Keith. we have not. Um, part of the difficulty is that it's hard to measure what you don't know about. If, for example, I submit a claim for a service that was never provided, and that claim looks totally legitimate, it's going to be paid. But that is, in fact, you know, a potentially, fra it's a fraudulent claim. So there are things like that that happen that, that are not captured in that. Um, we, we have noted the lack of a reliable estimate of fraud in Medicare and uh, urged CMS to work on it. And I believe that they are starting on a pilot to measure the extent of fraud in home health. It's, it's a difficult undertaking, but they are working on it. So when do you expect the uh, pilot to be rolled out? I think that they just um, talked about it in the most recent report that was released within the past few weeks, the Healthcare Fraud and Abuse Control. And I would imagine, you know, I, I can't speak for them because I don't know their exact plans, but I, I would imagine it would take some time. Dr. To, Coswell? To, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Do, do you want to finish, ma'am? I, I didn't want, okay. Dr. Koshko, do you? Uh, thank you. I don't have anything to add to Ms. Kane. Okay. Thank How about the, Mr. Vito? I think fraud thank is you. only when it's determined at a court of law that that's when fraud occurs. You know, you, you could have indications of fraud, but it's only when it's finalized and the case has been adjudicated. I, I think what we're trying to say is that CMS needs, they have data and they need more data. And when they have that data, they need to analyze that data. And that would help them identify what's going on in their programs. For example, in the Part D area, they, if they got information on what the plans are reporting as incidents of potential fraud, then they can look behind that. They could use that data to compare it to fraud areas to see if that contract, that, that, medic, that, that Part C pro, B program is actually doing a good job in detecting and preventing fraud, waste, and abuse. They can compare it to their others. So, that, so for me, I think you're asking about data and the use of data to make informed decisions and to target work, your work. And that's what we're advocating with CMS, that they use the data they have and maybe enhance some more data so that they would be able to target their resources in the best manner. Thank you. Next question. Uh, many 
of the monetary, criminal, and civil penalties for fraud were established in the 80s and 90s. Do you think these monetary penalty amounts should be updated? Uh, Ms. King? I don't have the expertise to comment on that, sir. Okay. Dr. Coswell? We have not done any work in that area. I, I am not a lawyer or a prosecutor. I can tell you, though, we, we have those people, and we would be certainly willing to answer your question or meet with you to talk about your question. Well, that's fine. But, yeah, I mean, if they were, uh, if, if, the, if the penalties were established in the 80s and 90s, that was a heck of a long time ago. So I would think they would need the updating. But, uh, yes, I'd like to get with you, Mr. Vito, on I, that. I think we could certainly Sure. Meet with you and tell you. Okay, next question. Uh, GAO has Medicare listed on their high risk programs. Medicare has probably been on their high risk list longer than some of my staff was, have been alive. <laughs> has CMS done anything recently or in the foreseeable future that would mo move Medicare off the high risk program list? Who would like to respond first? I will, sir. We are in the process of updating our high risk report. Um, for the next issuance. And Medicare is an inherently complex, it's an expensive program. It's, it, it, it is, as noted, you know, it, taking up a larger share of the federal budget and of the of national spending each year. So it's an intrinsically complex program, but we are in the process of evaluating whether it should continue to be on the high risk list. It has, however, been there since 1990 since the very beginning of our high-risk list. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Coswell. Well, I, I just want to comment on one of the efforts that CMS has underway regarding uh, Medicare Advantage, the Part C program. It's in the process of collecting encounter data from plans so that we better understand the services that they're providing to beneficiaries. I think their immediate plans are uh, eventually to use this to improve the risk adjustment, the adjusting payments for health status, uh, but the data has opportunities uh, to go well beyond that um, and allow CMS to do a better job of, of oversight. And we currently have work on CMS's plans and efforts uh, right now. We hope to be able to report later on this spring. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vito, would you I, like I, to comment? I, I think that um, Medicare program is certainly a complex program and a large amount of resources that the OIG is focused on looking at that program. We have results that continue to point out that there's things that can be done. We, we have shown where better use of legislation and, and policy rules have resulted in savings that have been achieved of 19 billion of the recommendations that the OIG has made. So we think that it's a very challenging program. We think we need to devote a lot of resources on that program in every way, whether it's evaluation, auditing, or investigating. And we could certainly use more funds to do that. But we definitely believe it's a challenging program, and we're going to do our best to keep, keep our eye on it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I know my time has expired, Chair. so I'll yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. That concludes the first round. We'll go to one follow-up per side, and I'll recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. Uh, <clears throat> private insurers and HMOs face many of the same challenges that Medicare does in managing its providers. In August of 2012, CMS announced a public-private partnership. Many in Congress applauded this overdue collaboration. But now, about a year and a half later, private plans and Medicare have shared only the most basic information. How can CMS contractors be allowed to better cooperate and benefit from their knowledge of suspect and untrustworthy providers for both Ms. King and Ms. Vito. Ms. Vito. Okay, well, in, in our uh, Part uh, D report, we recommended that CMS share the information on possible fraud issues with plans as well as law enforcement. So we, we think there is benefit to continuing sharing. You have to be careful what information you share but I think there's a way to do this, and our office has that partnership, and we're working through that, and we would be able to, again, take any question that you have. I'm not the expert on that, but we do have people in our office that would be willing to come and meet with you or handle any question you might have on that. Any, any other comments, Dr. Cosgrove? 
yes, I, I guess I would just like to mention the uh, Medicare Advantage and counter data that uh, CMS is currently being collected because I think that will give CMS a broader view of what's going on in what's becoming a very significant part of the, of the Medicare program, um, a much broader view than even one plan has. Uh, and those data, I think, hold a great deal of promise if CMS follows through and, and analyzes and uses those data. Okay. Uh, how many contracting officers are there at CMS? And are they required to be subject matter experts in their areas of contracts? And what type of training do they receive? Um, and how are they held accountable? How, are, how is their performance assessed? Ms. That, that's not an issue that, that, that we have looked at. And I, I don't know how many contracting um, officials there are there. Mr. Vito, do you know? Well, uh, we are in the process now of looking uh, at CMS contract, contracting, and we are uh, trying to provide you with a landscape look at how many dollars they have, the type of contracts they are, and who's administering the contracts. In addition to that, we're also going to be looking at how the contracts have been closed or not closed. So we hope within the next, by the end of this year, that we'll have a report that will provide some detailed information on just the general information about CMS and, and its contracting. Now, CMS has a range of contracting vehicles at its disposal. Some are very incentive-driven. Some are very flexible. Some are just cost-plus contracts. Can you talk a little bit about what parts of the contracting process could be streamlined and modernized? in order to hold contractors more accountable and achieve better return on investment for taxpayers? Is that for me? Yeah. Well, um, I, I don't think, I, I, I will not be able to answer that right now. We have current work under underway that also looks at contracting and how the contracting was handled in the ACA area. We hope that when we get that information, it will provide some of the question, answers to some of the questions that you have, and that's ongoing as well. The biggest contractors that CMS now are the MACs, the Medicare Administrative Contractors, and we did an evaluation of the implementation of contractor reform a few years ago, and there is a rigorous process set up to um, evaluate the contracts. Um, and the IG has done more recent work on that and recommended some improvements, but they, they do have uh, under the FAR, under the Federal Acquisition Regulation, um, an intensive process for awarding the contracts and also for measuring the contracts and awarding um, fees under it. We are also looking, though, at whether they could be using some additional or differ, different incentives in the program to drive better performance. And we should have a report on that later this year. All right, Chair, thanks, uh, panel. And now I recognize the ranking member five minutes for a follow-up question. Mr. Vito, I, I wanted to go back to my questions about Part D, specifically the CMS proposed rule to strengthen uh, Part D uh, with regard to fraud. And I've heard some concern that requiring physicians who wish to prescribe drugs to Medicare beneficiaries actually be enrolled in the program uh, is too much bureaucracy and interference for physicians. And I just wanted to get your assessment of that. Do you believe that it is overly burdensome to require a physician writing prescriptions for which Medicare will pay be subject to, the, to, the, to some basic enrollment standards? What's your opinion on that? I think that we had previously made that a recommendation. And if we did, that means that we think it's appropriate to do. Uh, I, I think it's always a challenge to find the right balance, and that's what we seek to do here, to, to make sure that the program is properly safeguarded and that there's not too much burden. So those are the things that we come to when, when, we, when we make a recommendation. All right. I appreciate your insight. I, I, as I mentioned in my opening statement, um, this is an important topic, and that's why I introduced the, the Part D Prescription Drug Integrity Act, and I think we can. And, and have to do more in the Part D program to help address the, the prescription drug abuse uh, epidemic. I have no uh, further questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, members do have other questions. We'll submit them to you in writing. We ask that you promptly uh, respond to those questions in writing. 
And uh, <clears throat> I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit their questions for the record. Um, members should submit their questions by the close of business on Tuesday, March 18th. You've been uh, addressing a very important issue. We thank you very much for your, your work and uh, look forward to continue to work with you. Without objection, the subcommittee is now adjourned.